name's Dan Robeson, and I am the Emergency Management Coordinator for Johnson County, Kansas. Thank you all for being here tonight for our annual National Weather Service uh, spotter presentation. Now, before I hand this over to Andy Bailey from the National Weather Service, I'd like to take a quick moment to make a plea for preparedness. And uh, I wanted to start by mentioning that, as all of you know, Johnson County, like any other community, is at risk from disasters. And what we do about that risk matters. And what you personally do about that risk matters. It matters to your family and your friends and your neighbors, it matters to me and the county and to the community as a whole. And what we do in Johnson County Emergency Management, our organization, is we focus on ways to build a better prepared and a more resilient community. And we do that in a myriad of ways, but one of the ways that we focus on, in partnership with our city partners, is enhancing uh, the dialogue about preparedness. We want more people to talk about preparedness, share what they've done um, uh, individually um, in preparedness, and also evaluate what they could do more regarding preparedness. And that's where you come in. This is our ask, is that for those of you that are part of an organization, a school, a business, community organization, neighborhood group, uh, faith-based organization, uh, if you're part of one of those groups that could benefit from more preparedness, which I believe we all can, uh, we'd love to partner with you, uh, Johnson County Emergency Management. And we'd like to work with you, and we can do that in a variety of ways. We can uh, provide a presentation at your uh, next meeting that you have. We can provide literature, brochures for you to help promote preparedness within, within your organization, or just provide information to help um, coordinate activities in terms of preparedness. So we want to make sure that um, you don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you can go to our website, Johnson County Emergency Management website, and from that front page, you can fill out a form to request setting up a presentation. We'll get back with you and, and set that up. Also from our website, um, you can uh, see the link for Notify JOCO, which is the county's mass notification system, our emergency mass notification system. And we encourage everybody that lives, works, and plays in Johnson County to set up an account. The best way to, uh, to sign up is to go online, create an account, um, and put in all your information of the ways that you want to get contacted in an emergency. Um, the quickest way to sign up is that you could text right now if you wanted to the word notify JOCO to 888-777 and that'll automatically sign you up to receive text messages. Uh, but we encourage everybody to go online and create an account so you can update your information in the future. Uh, also, we wanted to mention that um, uh, today you're gonna hear a lot about uh, what to do as, as a spotter and, uh, and guidance there. And uh, if you don't already know, we have a great organization here in Johnson County, uh, Johnson County ECS, Emergency Communication Services. It's been around for over half a century. Uh, a very professional, well-organized group um, that does a great service for our community. And if you're not already part of that group and you have an interest in that, uh, you may have seen there's a booth. Uh, Johnson County ECS has a booth, uh, and the leadership is here tonight. So um, if you haven't connected with them and you have some interest in potentially being part of that uh, group, uh, please feel free to touch base with them uh, after tonight. They'll be at the, the booth after the presentation. With that, um, I just want to make sure that you know, we, we hope that uh, you won't hesitate to reach out to Johnson County Emergency Management if we can ever be of assistance uh, to you. And we thank you for being here tonight. Uh, with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Andy Bailey from the National Weather Service. All right, welcome to our first spotter training session of the year. Doesn't it feel like severe weather season out there? As cold as it is. Public Speaking 101 is know your audience. And since I don't know many of you, but there's a lot of familiar faces in the audience, I just real quick question. Who here, this is your first time you've been to a spotter training course? See a show of hands. Wow, that's great. So a lot of new people today. That's good. How many of you could this could maybe be your 10th or 15th time, but you just kind of lost count? A few of those as well. Well, good. Maybe some of the more advanced people can help some of the some of the beginners as we go through this. But there's quite a few things we're going to cover in the next hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half or so. 
Start out with an introduction, tell you a little bit about the National Weather Service, why it is that we need storm spotters, why do we go out a couple of months every year, three or four nights a week, and, and deliver this training? Why do we do that? We'll talk about why that is. We'll have a real quick review of, of kind of what happened severe weather-wise last year, 2018. We'll hit that quick, and then we'll move on because we have a lot to go through. We'll talk about some meteor meteorological basics. How do storms form? What are the main ingredients for thunderstorms? What determines uh, what storms are severe or how severe they are or how strong they are? There's almost like a cookbook of ingredients to put together to form the different types of storms. We'll go through that and talk about what that is. We'll talk about the various thunderstorm types and the hazards they tend to produce because not all thunderstorms are the same. Different ingredients lead to different thunderstorm types which then lead to different impacts from the storms. We will cover uh, how to look at those storms and what part of the storm you should be looking at. What should you be identifying from those storms that will give you a clue about what kind of severe weather you can possibly expect. We'll talk about how you can maintain situational awareness. What are you going to do to make sure you know what to anticipate later in the day? Most of the severe weather we have is pretty well forecast and is known well in advance, oftentimes days in advance. There's some pretty easy things you can do to have a good idea and be more informed every single day so that when you're out looking at the storms, you have a better idea of what to expect. We're going to talk about the kind of weather resources and safety information that's available to you uh, on a daily basis that you can make use of. And then finally, we're going to, we're going to uh, finish up with how to report, what to report, and how to, where to report it through. Real quick, one more question. How many of you are with Johnson County ECS as part of the official Johnson County Storm Spotter? Okay, a few of you. For the rest of you that aren't, uh, one of the things we're going to have is our 1-800 number for our office over in Pleasant Hill, the National Weather Service. Towards the end of this, we'll ask you to put it into your phones. And also, if you picked up one of those little business cards uh, that were at, was out of the front desk, that also has reporting information, kind of steps you through what we want and how to report that in as well. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, I guess some housekeeping, this is really important. This isn't second grade. If you have to go to the bathroom, you need to step out for any reason, go ahead and do it. There's not a scheduled break in here. So if you need to, if you need to have a break, go ahead and do that. Uh, don't wait for the break because there's going to be one. Uh, there's going to be a few survey questions throughout, just like you did earlier uh, when I asked the questions. Please do participate because that helps everybody learn when you uh, participate as a group. We'll have some Q&A at the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions. So let's just try to get through this. Now, if you have something that you just can't get past, a question that's burning, that's really gonna, you need answered uh, to help you understand something, please ask it. But otherwise, if it's something else, let's wait till the end of that. And then finally, this is the most important thing, make sure your phone is on silent. We say that every single time, and it was embarrassing, because I thought mine was on silent once, and my wife called in the middle, the middle of it. She knew where I was at. I don't know why she's calling my phone. But if you can take a moment, just check and make sure you've switched it to silent or vibrate, I would appreciate that. Okay, so let's talk about what the National Weather Service does. We do probably a few more things than you may re realize. Now, every single day our forecasters produce a variety of forecasts. It may be the forecast that you see uh, that says, you know, partly cloudy, high of 35 degrees, but it may, or it may be a, a forecast that helps our aviation partners, the airlines and the airports operate more efficiently. We produce a variety of graphics, and social media has really aided our dissemination of that. Real quick, how many people here follow the National Weather Service on Facebook and or Twitter? Most of you do? Good. We'll go over that a little bit later, but there is an amazing amount of information that the forecasters, forecasters at our office put together and put out, and most of it in graphical format. makes it pretty easy to understand what we're talking about. We work very closely with what we call our core partners, emergency managers such as Dan Robeson and the folks at Johnson County Emergency Management. We participate in exercises. We uh, provide what we call decision support services to help them deal with any kind of special events that may be going on in the community. We try to work very closely with our partners to really build relationships and give them the kind of service that they require. Now that being said, we also work with the general public. We have uh, uh, weather radio that you can get forecasts from, but we actually have a phone number that's intended to get your forecast from, so you can call our office up, you can listen to the forecast. If you still have questions, you can remain on the line and one of our forecasters will answer the phone and, and answer your question for you. So if you have a question, hey, what's it going to be like 
at 3 o'clock on Thursday because I plan on having a contractor over to pour cement in my driveway. You can call us up and ask. Our forecasters are, are happy to answer. And that's something that's pretty unusual in today's world to be able to call a federal agency and speak with the people who are actually doing the job just in a matter of seconds. So, you know, it's just something to consider. And then finally, and what we're really going to focus on tonight is we are really the sole voice and the sole source for issuing severe weather watches and warnings. Everything from the winter weather that we may be experiencing in the next couple of days to the tornadic uh, thunderstorms that are going to be rolling across the plains come April and May. The National Weather Service is a source for that. That's something we, we don't take lightly. It's something we are training for constantly, and our forecasters are pretty vigilant and pretty, um, pretty dedicated to that mission, because that's really the core of our mission. So let's talk about why we need spotters. We've got a radar that was, it was built in 1993, but it, it's been upgraded steadily since then. It is really one of the top radar systems in the world. It's a remarkable system, our, our WSR 88D Doppler radar. It helps us see quite a few things, but it has its limits. Some of it has to do with some, some physics, and some of it has to do with some geometry that we just can't overcome. There's not like a, a simple fix and that we just need you know, to wait for faster computers to fix it. Part of it is, depending on where the thunderstorm is in relation to the radar, if the storms are at quite a distance away, we'll actually be overshooting the part of the storm, the lower levels of the storm that we need to be seeing to identify whether or not, for instance, is the storm rotating? Is it rotating in the lower levels where we're concerned about possible tornado genesis? Is the hail that we're seeing in the mid and upper levels of the storm, is that making it down to the ground? The radar is not going to tell us that. That's one of the reasons that we need spotter reports. We need your eyes on those storms to let us know exactly what's going on with the storms at ground level. There's no substitute for a trained spotter looking at those storms. Your reports also help our meteorologists fill in some gaps. Because the radar might be showing one thing, but maybe they're not really expecting it. Because the atmosphere doesn't seem to be... You know, I mentioned there's ingredients that produce the different types of thunderstorms. Maybe we're missing a few of those ingredients, or at least it appears that we're missing those ingredients. The radar may be showing us a rotation where we're like, you know, this is just not a tornado day because things aren't coming together. But we start getting phone calls, hey, I got a funnel cloud, hey, I got a wall cloud. Well, we're going to say, well, evidently some, something is missing. We don't know that all the ingredients aren't there. We're getting reports that the radar is showing that we're probably going to have to warn on. That's happened several times where a spotter report has kind of tipped us over the edge as far as are we going to issue the warning or not. We get a report one way or another for a spotter, it really helps us make up our mind. The other thing your reports do is it lends credibility to our warnings. Oftentimes you may be watching TV and you may hear the, the meteorologist say, uh, the National Weather Service has issued another tornado warning. This has been a Doppler indicated tornado warning, which means the radar is, the, the meteorologist is looking at the radar and sees some rotation. If there's a high probability it could become tornadic, but a tornado hasn't been sighted yet. How likely are you to seek action, or how likely do you think the average person is to take action on that? Probably not as likely as they are if, if, if they say the National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning. Not only is Doppler radar indicating strong rotation, spotters are showing a funnel cloud to give the location as three miles west of your house. You're probably a lot more likely to seek action then, aren't you? you actually hear that something's going on. So your reports really do oftentimes lead to people taking action. And that's ultimately what we want from these warnings. We want people to heed the warnings, take action to protect themselves so that they can, you know, live to see another day. So let's talk about 2018. It was very active in our office. At least there were, there were some very active days. We issued a total of 242 warnings. And many of that, most of those were based on radar. We had several tornadoes, but all of them, fortunately, were weak. They were EF0 tornadoes, which is the weakest level of tornadoes we have. They go from EF0 to, to EF5. EF0, sometimes, there's barely any perceptible damage. I can tell you one of the tornadoes I surveyed last year was out at Lake Lottawana. We had to actually look really hard to see uh, the, the tornadic damage in some locations because it was nothing more than a few branches broken here. Other places, it was roofs ripped off of homes, but it wasn't like that everywhere. So they were relatively weak tornadoes. We had some big hail. We had baseball-sized hail reported in several different locations around the county, or around our, our county warning area, the area we forecast for. And 
the strongest straight line wind that was reported was 71 miles an hour. It's a pretty typical year for us, maybe a little low on the tornado count, but all in all, it's a pretty typical year. So let's talk about those different types of ingredients we need for thunderstorms to, to come together. First thing we need is we need moisture. Moisture is really the fuel for a thunderstorm. As long as you keep pumping that fuel into the storm, that storm's going to keep on cranking. If you cut off the moisture supply, that storm's going to probably die. Okay, so having a steady supply of moisture is going to determine how long lived, in some cases, how long lived the storms are, or how long uh, the whole event is going to be. Another thing we look for is we look for a triggering mechanism, something to give the atmosphere a little bit of a nudge upwards. Because all thunderstorms are really is a series of updrafts and downdrafts. But more times than not, the atmosphere itself is not going to get that going just from having some unstable air. You've got to have something to push it upwards. And usually it's a cold front, a warm front, an outflow boundary from another thunderstorm coming through that will give you just enough of a push upwards to get those storms initiated. We call that a trigger. They tend to be a focusing mechanism for thunderstorm development. We need a lot of energy in the atmosphere, and sometimes you'll hear this referred to as instability. The more unstable the atmosphere is, uh, the more the atmosphere is going to encourage vertical motion. The days that we have the most damaging, destructive uh, thunderstorms are the days that we have the most energy available in the atmosphere. Our, th our forecasters look in three dimensions up in the atmosphere to determine how much energy is available. And one of the things you will, you will learn when we talk about building your situational awareness and reading the situation report is that you can actually, they'll actually say, we're very unstable today. It should be a very explosive day for thunderstorm to develop. And all they're doing is they're diagnosing the atmosphere so that you don't have to. They'll tell you whether or not it's going to be unstable. And then finally, the, the fourth ingredient, this isn't necessary to get thunderstorms to form, but we really do need wind shear to get severe thunderstorms to form in most cases. That wind shear, how the wind changes with height as you go up in the atmosphere, is, is going to really be a big player in just how destructive the, the thunderstorms <coughs> could be as they, as they develop. So that's really the fourth ingredient that our forecasters will look for. Now, you may have days where all of those ingredients are in place. It's very humid, very very um, unstable. There's quite a bit of wind shear. You see clouds in different layers going in different directions. You may even have a front coming through that gives the air the initial nudge upwards. There could be something else preventing those storms from developing. More times than not, that something else is a cap. A cap is nothing more than a very warm layer of air several thousand feet above the ground. It acts like a lid, and as those updrafts get going, they run into that cap, and the cap just pretty much keeps a lid on it. Just in nearby adjacent areas, you may have thunderstorms that are able to form because there isn't a cap in place or the cap is weaker. But oftentimes, that cap is going to prevent thunderstorms from developing. So that's something else that you can read in the situation report when we go through that a little bit later. It will give you an idea whether or not we're expecting uh, thunderstorms to develop. Okay, let's talk about the various thunderstorm hazards that are out there. Okay, so as you see in the video, straight line winds is the first thing we're going to talk about. Straight line winds can be incredibly destructive. Oftentimes, uh, it, it, well essentially it's just the outflow from a thunderstorm, it's the downdraft from the downdraft hits the ground and spreads out horizontally along the earth. Um, you can produce winds 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, occasionally nearing 100, but very, very rarely over 100 miles an hour with straight line winds. Now the damage tends to be more widespread than a tornado. You may have a thunderstorm that produces a tens of mile long path or even hundreds of miles long damage path from straight line winds. So it can be, it can be a lot more widespread damage, but it's usually not quite the magnitude of the damage you would, you would experience with a tornado. As far as when you need to worry, usually when we get winds 50 to 60 miles an hour, 60 is around kind of the base threshold for, um, for us to issue a severe thunderstorm warning. You're going to have anything that's loose, um, that's not secured, blowing around. I know in my 
my deck, I've got some patio furniture, and I know that when that stuff starts sliding from one side of the deck to the other, usually we're getting around 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Usually those sorts of days also tend to occur on garbage pickup day in my neighborhood, and the garbage flies around, the garbage cans are going everywhere. By the time you get up to 65 to 70 miles an hour, that's when the storms start to actually produce damage. You're going to see some decent sized limbs breaking off healthy trees, and I'm not talking about little twigs. You know, things two, three inches in diameter might be snapping off, off trees. You get above that, you're going to start seeing damage to homes, maybe some vinyl siding ripped off uh, houses, shingles may start uh, getting blown off of roofs from 70 to 75 miles an hour. Okay, let's talk about uh, hail. I have no idea what this guy's doing. I think he's trying to protect his windshield from hail. circulating in a thunderstorm long enough, or they're held aloft long enough, they, until they grow big enough that they can't be held up anymore and then they fall to the ground. <coughs> Almost all thunderstorms contain hail of some size, but most of the hail is melted before it hits the ground. That's why most of the storms that move through don't have hail at the ground level, because once it drops below the freezing level, it starts to melt, which is a good thing, I guess, otherwise we'd have a lot more uh, hail damage out there. Um, Hail can get pretty big. Around here, most of our hail tends to be P to maybe dime-sized hail. But the world record hailstone, uh, at least the most recent one, is 8 inches. It was found in, I believe, Vivian, South Dakota. Yeah. But it wasn't too long ago. I believe it was in the early 2000s or late 1990s. The record hailstone was found in Meadville, Missouri. It was kind of up in north central Missouri. And I want to say that was around 6 and 3 quarters, something like that. So for us to get huge hail is not completely out of the question. Okay, so when do you need to worry? Well, first of all, even hail smaller than ping pong ball size is going to hurt. It's going to hurt real bad. Okay, if you get hit by dime-sized hail, uh, you, it's probably going to be leaving welts on your body. Once you get to ping pong, ping pong ball size and larger, it's going to be leaving dents on your car. It's going to be damaging your asphalt roof on your homes. Uh, it can be damaging your siding quite a bit. Uh, baseball size hail is going to be breaking windshields and going through windows of houses. Uh, the most extreme example of wind driven baseball or softball size hail I know about was when I used to work in Rapid City, South Dakota. We had this huge supercell thunderstorm that moved across the plains, and there was baseball to softball size hail superimposed on 100 mile an hour straight line winds. There was actually holes punched into the side of some of the some of the farmhouses. There was hundreds of cattle killed that were hit by this. It was pretty devastating. It produced a damage path so extreme that it pretty much killed everything in its path, including the vegetation. And over the course of the next couple of days after the storm, the damage path actually became visible in the satellite imagery because all the vegetation turned brown for about 100 miles long and up to 10 or 15 miles wide. It was, it was pretty incredible. So hail can really do some pretty incredible things. So let's talk about uh, flooding. <laughs> wow. Okay, so flooding around here is actually one of our bigger severe weather risks we face. There'll be a lot of days that we're forecasting quite a bit of severe weather during the overnight hours, but more times than not, what happens is, is the severe threat, or at least the hail, wind, and tornadic threat, goes away, and we end up with just a heavy rain situation overnight that leads to flash flooding. 
Usually we need three to five inches of rain, but if it's been an extremely wet period, we can have flash flooding with as low as one to two inches of rain if the ground is already saturated. Here in the metro area, we're a lot more susceptible to flash flooding because we have far more concrete. Areas that used to be grass and trees and stuff that would normally absorb the water won't anymore, obviously, and it all just runs off, exasperating the problem. We, we, we've seen the impacts. We, was it, I think it was two summers ago, we had two or three pretty devastating flash floods in a row near state line. Uh, There's a lot of car dealers that, that um, sustained damage. And I think we've maybe got a photo in here somewhere. Maybe it's the next slide. Yeah. Remember the coaches that was, that was pretty much underwater? That's, isn't that near state line? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, I think that, that restaurant's actually closed now because of that flood. So, you know, the, the times to be concerned, anytime you're in your car, you need to be aware, uh, first of all, that, that guy that drove into the floodwaters was going too fast, right? Anytime there's heavy rain, you need to be aware about where the low water crossings are, or kind of if you're going down an elevation, you're going down a hill, maybe be looking far ahead to see is there water running over the road. You absolutely never want to drive through a flood, flooded roadway. It only takes about 18 inches of water to float most vehicles. And I guess the, the other thing I would mention is, let's say your home or your business is getting flooded, you just need to evacuate. Don't try to stay behind and save stuff. It's too late. You just need to get out and seek shelter. Get to higher ground. Watching that, it's pretty easy to understand the definition of a tornado is a violently rotating column of air extending from downward from a thunderstorm. That circulation is in contact with the ground. The cloud itself may not be, but if that wind circulation is down at the ground, it's a tornado. And as I mentioned before, tornadoes are rate, rated EF0 to EF5 based on the damage they produce. Wind engineers have put together a scale called the Enhanced Vegeta Scale which allows us to go out after a storm has gone through, look at the types of structures that are damaged and to what degree they were damaged, and then kind of work backwards to get an estimated wind speed of the tornado. That's really the only way we can, we can estimate the wind speed inside a tornado. We do have Doppler radar me measurements, but most of the time the Doppler radar is not looking at the right part of the storm, it's looking too high, or the resolution is of the radar data is just too coarse to be able to get a good idea of, of the peak wind speeds in that Tornado. And that's where the debris will tell more of the story than the, uh, than the radar data will. So when do you need to be concerned about a tornado? Well, like the bullet says, every time, right? There is no such thing as a, as a minor tornado. There's no such thing as a tornado you don't need to worry about. You need to take every tornado seriously. We do know that, that some storms are, are stronger than others. Some days are more, there's more potential for stronger thunderstorms or stronger tornadoes. But again, if your home is under the gun from a tornado, you're at risk. You need to seek shelter and take it seriously. 
Real quick, what are you going to do if you're at home and a tornado warning is issued or you know a tornado is bearing down your house? What's the number one thing to do? Go to the basement, right? If you don't have a basement, we tell people get as low as possible to an interior room, essentially putting as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. Very simple, okay? Well, it seems simple to us if we've lived in the Midwest a while, but people from, <coughs> from California, for instance, they moved in, they'd probably be freaked out. They may need to be told what to do. I'd be freaked out in an earthquake, so I understand. The other thing to be aware of is the risk really goes up at night, and a big reason for that is how easy is it to see a tornado at night? Not really easy. It's also dangerous to be out spotting storms at night, isn't it? Because you're just not going to be able to see as much. So most of the times when we're warning on tornadoes at night, we're missing that key piece of information. We're missing the eyes on the storms, the spotters telling us what they see. As a result, the tornado warnings tend to be a little bit less reliable. We don't get as much lead time for the, or the time from when we issue the tornado warning to when the tornadoes touch down. It's just a little bit more dangerous uh, when we have those nocturnal, or nocturnal tornado events. So let's take a look at this, this funnel cloud. Initially, if you can't tell if it's touched down or not, but as we go a little bit further into the future, we'll see that it does, in fact, extend all the way to the ground. It's pretty easy to see the tornadoes when there's nothing in the way, right? And the ground is flat and there's no trees in the way or buildings in the way. Is that, is that the way all of Johnson County is? Not really, right? You may be looking around trees, buildings, hills. It's not going to be that easy. Now, we mentioned this several times already, but the, uh, the Fujita scale. Fortunately, the majority of the tornadoes that form are on the lower end of the scale, the EF0, EF1 uh, scale tornadoes. Generally, uh, wind 65 to 100 miles an hour. Usually, they're short-lived. They don't, they don't move a long ways. But I will also tell you that the statistics are skewed a little bit towards the EF0 because you can have a mile-wide tornado out in the middle of Kansas, and if it doesn't hit anything, we don't have anything really to rate, to rate it with, right? So that goes in the books as an EF0 tornado. Got to hit something for us to really know if it's stronger than EF0. And then you go all the way to the other end of the scale, around 1% of tornadoes are EF4 and EF5 tornadoes. Now, the EF4 and EF5 tornadoes are responsible for the bulk of the fatalities, but there's very, very few tornadoes of that strength. I don't even remember if there was any in 2018. That's a sad, I should probably know. I, I almost positive there weren't any fives, and I don't think there were any fours relatively quiet year nationwide from when I go to last year. Jenny, do you happen to know offhand? Put you on the spot. I don't think there was either. It was, I guess, a good year for uh, lack of high employment. Okay. Now, we mentioned that there's, lot, there's, there's three or four ingredients that we're looking at in every, every day to determine what type or what, yeah, basically what type of thunderstorms could develop. There's really an entire spectrum of thunderstorm types out there. We're going to focus on four main types of thunderstorms, a single cell thunderstorm, and then two types of multi-cell thunderstorms, the multi-cell cluster and the multi-cell squall line. And then the big dog, the granddaddy of, the, of all the thunderstorms, the supercell. And essentially, as you look at that, in general, your energy level and shear increases as you go from left to right on this graph. So over there on the single cell or pulse thunderstorm side of it, you probably don't have a lot of instability and you don't have a whole lot of wind shear. By the time you get over to the supercell side of things, there's a whole lot of both. And that's what our forecasters look at every single day during thunderstorm season to determine what types of storms should develop and then what type of severe weather should those storms produce. So let's start out talking about the, uh, the single cell storms. These things are generally a single updraft. The air goes up and the thunderstorm produces rain, and then oftentimes the rain will fall back through the updraft, killing it, turning the updraft into a downdraft. You'll remember that I mentioned that um, the moisture is the fuel for the thunderstorm. Well, it's the updraft that's bringing that moisture into the storm. So if you can cut off that moisture supply, you're going to kill the storm. And that's exactly what happens in a single cell type of storm. Since they tend to be so short-lived, generally 30 to, or 20 to 30 minutes, 
not a lot of time to produce big hail, not going to produce a tornado, probably not going to produce flash flooding. Maybe in the right circumstances could produce some, some real strong uh, downdraft or downburst winds that can produce something called a microburst, but that's relatively rare as well. Most single cell or pulse type storms generally don't produce severe weather. They still produce lightning, which we already said is dangerous, but this is not going to be something that we're going to be worried about to be a prolific severe, <coughs> severe weather producer. As we get just a little bit more, oh, okay, sorry, here's just an example. We've seen this before. Looks like a really big cumulus cloud. May not even have an anvil on top. I mean, it probably will once it gets to the mature stage, but these things can go out and produce a little bit of rain and just die. Generally pretty easy. As we get a little bit more shear or instability in the, in the, in the atmosphere, we move on to the multi-cell thunderstorms. The first one we're going to talk about is the cluster, multi-cell cluster. You can kind of think of this as a whole bunch of single-cell storms kind of all mashed together. And in this little idealized diagram here, you can see there's one single-cell storm, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. And they're all in a different stage of the life cycle, okay? Over here on the, on the left, we have towering cumulus, we have the mature stage, and then we have the dissipating stage where they're just raining themselves out. Now these have a little bit better chance of producing severe weather, it tends to be a little bit longer lived. I would say primarily the, the biggest threat from these types of storms would probably be flash flooding. And oftentimes what will happen is you'll get all these individual storm segments to kind of what we call train over the same area. So one storm goes, moves over an area, dumps its rain and moves off. Another storm develops upstream, moves over the same area. And you just get storm after storm moving over the same area. You end up with pretty heavy rain in the course of two or three hours, and you end up with flash flooding. You can still get some small hail. You can still get maybe some, some downburst or downdraft winds, but generally they're not going to be tornado producers. Okay, here's an example of a multi-cell storm. It's, it's a little bit of a chaotic thing, just a bunch of different updrafts. There's one, there's another updraft, and another updraft. Maybe a more mature stage in the background there producing that anvil. There's just a lot of things going on there. Looking at the radar will probably help you identify it as well because you see a cluster of storms there. Another type of multi-cell storm, and probably the one we're more concerned about here when it comes to severe weather, is the squall line. All the squall line really is is a long line of connected thunderstorms. It's kind of uh, stretched out in a, a pretty long linear fashion. Now, when I say a long line, it could be anything from 20 or 30 miles long to several hundred miles long covering several states. Oftentimes they'll form along or just behind a cold front and they'll, they'll actually behave much like a cold front like we had come through this morning where the winds will shift abruptly, the temperature will drop as, as it moves through. Now, one of the things we're gonna focus on is this cloud feature here that tends to form along the leading edge of the squall line. That's a shelf cloud. The shelf cloud is usually gonna be indicative of the outflow winds coming out of that thunderstorm. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be severe. It doesn't mean they're going to be 60, 70 miles an hour. But the winds are probably going to shift direction. They're probably going to be blowing out of that thunderstorm once that shelf cloud gets overhead. So we take a look at it. Here's a shelf cloud here. In this case, this whole system is probably moving at us. I know you've all seen these before. Here's a time-lapse image, or at least it will be once it gets started. So watch the shelf cloud here as it's nearing. Also notice there's a lot of little cloud fragments that are forming kind of underneath it, but there was some back there. I'm going to play this again, but see these little cloud fragments? Those are called scud clouds, and oftentimes those can be mistaken for funnel clouds or maybe even a wall cloud. They're not. They're just little cloud fragments underneath the main, the main cloud deck. It's, you don't got to, when you have a squall and you don't usually have to be worried about a tornado. You need to be worried about the strong straight line winds. So that's why you want to key in on that shelf cloud. But let's watch that video. Cloud, the winds will be shifting direction underneath there as these little cloud fragments form. Um, now, they, they just kind of form and dissipate really rapidly in time lapse. But if you're watching that in real time, that might persist for a couple of minutes. And you might get, get kind of freaked out, like, oh, what's that? You know, but again, because you're situationally aware, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, you've briefed yourself as far as what kind of severe weather you can expect later in the day. You've already trained your mind to know that we're probably not looking at tornadoes today. So you're 
You're going to be focused more on straight line lines. Okay, let's move on to the supercell thunderstorm. Remember, the supercell forms on the days that we have the most instability or energy and the most wind shear in the atmosphere. These are the extreme, uh, the extreme end of the spectrum. In general, we only have a handful of days in this part of the country that we have conditions that are conducive for supercell development. Certainly less than 10 days every year, probably more like five or less that we actually have conditions for supercell thunderstorms. You'll notice as far as the threat goes, high potential for, for hail, strong winds, flash flooding, and tornadoes. Most of the really damaging severe weather days that we have are from supercell thunderstorms. Now one thing I should mention, and I didn't, the definition of a supercell thunderstorm is a storm with a persistent rotating updraft. We're going to see a time lapse in a little bit, you'll see that whole updraft just rotating like this. Now when you're out actually watching it in real time, you won't be able to see that, because that whole updraft might be 5 to 8 miles in diameter, and something that big isn't going to be going around that fast, so you're not going to be able to see it with the naked eye, you just have to understand that it is rotating. So let's take, an image, uh, take a look at this image here. This is just a static image. Here's the updraft here. See how it almost looks circular? Like it's smeared in a, as it's rotating around. Pretty classic looking uh, supercell there. Here's an example of a time lapse. If you're watching this whole thing just kind of rotate like that. Now as you're watching this, you need to, okay, you need to understand that this rain-free base is the mesocyclone and that's, uh, that's where you have to key in on you're also going to want to be looking in at a smaller area underneath that rain-free base known as the wall cloud because that wall cloud is where any possible tornadoes will come from. And you should be able to see that thing rotate if it's, if it's a bona fide wall cloud. Now that was a time-lapse image and you can, I think that's a time -lapse image. You can kind of see this stuff going around really qu quickly. If you're actually watching with the naked eye and you're looking at a wall cloud, it may be a lot slower than that. You may be looking at cloud fragments kind of doing something like this really slowly, but if that wall cloud is a half mile across, that's really cooking pretty good, you know? So it, don't expect the rotation of wall cloud to be doing something like that. It's going to be going quite a bit slower. Okay, so let's take a look at this. we kind of got a wall cloud in here, and, and it's... This is in real time, it's not time lapse. Do you see anything that you're concerned about? Right off the bat, it looks like we got a tornado forming pretty rapidly over there, don't we? It didn't take long at all. Let's, I'm going to back it up again, we're going to start it again. <coughs> okay, so watch. Got the, got the rotation going on there, and very quickly we get a tornado to develop. This is also maybe a good place to make a point. Tornadoes don't drop down or touch down. Okay, there's kind of, we, we, that's how we kind of describe it, like a tornado is descending from the thunderstorm. It's really more of a coming together of several different air masses that kind of produce the rotation that spit up a tornado. And that was pretty evident there that you didn't see anything drop out of the cloud. Things just kind of came together in the tornado developed. Okay. Let's go through some, let's debunk some tornado myths. One that I hear quite often is tornadoes really never strike big cities. Well, back in, I think it was 1999, of all places, a tornado hit downtown Salt Lake City. That's, they don't hit many tornadoes anywhere, anyway, let alone in, in the city there. And then just a few years ago, in fact, this happened several times in the last decade or so, tornadoes have struck Fort Worth. There's a pretty famous video of the most recent example it went through like this uh, trucking company and it was picking up entire semi-trailers and tossing them around. It was amazing. Okay, so yeah, clearly tornadoes can strike cities. How about this one? Have you ever heard tornadoes are attracted to mobile homes? <coughs> not really the case, not true, it's a myth. The, the reality is older mobile homes were not built as well as a, as a regular stick built home, so it took a lot less wind to produce the damage. So you could get a relatively weak tornado go through and not really do much to a stick-built home, or maybe a whole neighborhood of stick-built homes, goes through a mobile home park and it completely destroys it. That's because the older standards for mobile home construction were quite a bit lower than, than stick-built homes. I'm 
many people have heard, oh, there's a river here, the tornado can't cross it. I hear that all the time. Not true. Tornadoes go right across there. Tornadoes can't travel up or down hills or mountains. Not true. I think it was in Grand Teton National Park or Yellowstone National Park, there's a record of a tornado descending from like 10,000 feet on the side of a mountain all the way down to the mountain valley. Pretty, pretty incredible. We've got several, several examples of tornadoes and mountains. There. And then, in this case, you know, I'm protected by something. How many people have heard of the Tonganoxie split? <laughs> right? Complete crap. It doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, there's nothing magical about Tonganoxie that the insurance split can go around. Really? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Scud. Now, I didn't even know that this is what Scud meant. Jenny, you put it in the spotter. Jenny Maples, spotter talk. Uh, strata, what's, what's Scud stand for? Something under death? Yeah, well, what is it? Yellow. <coughs> Did you forget it? Because it was in there, and I, I can't remember. Strata cumulus under death? Does that make sense? Okay. But scud, let's just remember scud, okay? <laughs> scud clouds are these little ragged features underneath the clouds. They can look pretty, pretty scary. They can oftentimes look like, almost like a funnel cloud or tornadic in nature. They can actually be extending all the way down to the ground, touching the ground. A good way to distinguish between a scud cloud and maybe a real funnel cloud is a scud cloud is gonna look pretty ragged. It's gonna be changing pretty rapidly. Whereas if we have a bona fide funnel cloud, more than likely it's going to be a lot smoother in appearance. Okay? It's going to look like it's more circular and rotating as opposed to the kinds of things we hear, see here that are pretty red. We've all seen things like that. It kind of, it can be kind of, it can kind of freak you out, right? When you see something coming through and you see these things rapidly ascending into the cloud base. <laughs> but if you understand what the environment, what's going on, they're really nothing. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting to mention SLCs. What's an SLC for the more experienced people here? Scary, scary, scary looking cloud, that's right. Scud are just scary looking clouds, SLCs. Nothing really to worry about. Oh, I guess that's just you. I already went through this where I can go through it. Okay. So look, we're gonna we're just gonna go through this real quick and see if we're gonna identify some of the features. And these are some good questions to be asking yourself. I'm going to start over since you may not have been watching this. But we're going to go through these, go through these one at a time. Now, you may not know if this is part of a supercell. I'm going to tell you it's not. But do you see any kind of persistent rotation? Anyone? <coughs> do you see any debris clouds or clouds that are near or touching the surface? Maybe. Kind of hard to tell some of these, some of those scud and or well, I just gave it away. Some of the scud clouds were behind some of the buildings, right? But yeah, this, this really isn't part of a super cell, and I wouldn't expect you to know that just by looking at this picture. There wasn't really any rotation. There was some debris, or actually there were some, maybe some clouds extending near the, the surface, but do you suppose we had a tornado here? Or a fog cloud? No. Just kind of some junk hanging from underneath those clouds. How about this one? Let's watch what's going on here. Okay, this part of a this part of a supercell. You see any rotation? There's not really any rotation. There are some turbulence here and kind of like horizontal overturning. But I don't know that I saw any rotation. Certainly, there may have been some clouds real near the surface, right? But again, we don't have a rotation. We don't have a tornado. Now, okay, this is an easy one, right? <laughs> is it part of a supercell? It probably is, right? Is it persistent or rotating? We don't even have video. We kind of probably a pretty good bet that it's rotating. Now, there are some lookalikes that can fool you. And you'll want to make sure you look at this and really make sure it's rotating, but we're pretty sure it is, right? Is it touching the ground? It is not. At least the cloud is not. 
right? Remember, the definition of a, of a tornado isn't a rotating cloud. It's a rotating column of air in contact with the surface, violently rotating column of air in contact with the surface. So what we would want to look for is, is there any debris at the surface or any dust blowing around a circular motion? If there were, that would tell us that's a tornado, not just a fog cloud. I think we have a video here. Okay, we've got to go through the questions first. Let's take a look. See that condensation funnel really expands quickly, and that's a tornado. Okay. I'm not even going to ask the questions on this. <laughs> yeah. Part of a supercell, well, you can't tell by looking at this, but it is. Is it rotating? Yeah. Is it persistent? Yeah. Is it touching the surface, and is there debris? Yeah. That's pretty easy. But again, let's back up to some of those first couple of slides we looked at. It's kind of tough to tell what you were looking at, wasn't it? It's not. A lot of times what you'll see in spotter training is pretty, is pretty ideal. It's exactly the way you'd like it to be able to look every time if you're going to identify it. When you're out there, there's a lot of times you're not going to know what you're looking at. And it's not that you're dumb. It's just like, it's just, it's, there's a lot going on. Nothing is textbook. Almost nothing is textbook. And it, it can be difficult. And we're going to go through, when we're talking about reporting and how to report stuff in, we're going to tell you what to tell us, or, or report, if you're one of the ECS spotters, what to report into the county. Because that will, that will help. Okay. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about situational awareness. And when, we, when we're talking about situational awareness, what we're really getting at is how well do you know what to expect into the future? All right? And when it comes to weather... What kind of severe weather are we going to have? We're going to see a video here of a lot of people that aren't aware of their surroundings. They're not. They don't have good situational awareness. And you've probably seen an example of this uh, in your own life before. So as we mentioned, there, there's several ways that you can build your situational awareness as it pertains to weather. Um, when we're forecasting at the office, we have what we call a forecast funnel, where at the top of the funnel, we are, we are kind of uh, longer looking further into the future, maybe three or four days into the future. And we'll be giving you, not hints, but there'll be less certainty, and we'll be giving, producing things called outlooks, or things that are readily available, people will have various graphics on social media, or the situation report that's available on our website. You, you can look at that and get an idea of what to expect in the coming days. Okay, I think we've got some examples here. Uh, certainly we've got our Facebook and Twitter page there. And again, if you're not following those, we'd certainly encourage you to follow those if you're on social media. Not only can you build your situational awareness, but both of them allow you to report severe weather into us as it's happening. Uh, we also have something called the situation report though. This is our website. You can get to our website by going to weather.gov kc. And on our website, you'll find this little yellow banner up here. And you might not read that from where you're at, but it says situation report. Click on that, and it will take you to the document that gives you a lot better idea of what to expect when it comes to severe weather. We'll be talking about not only what days does severe weather look most likely, but what's the risk. You can see we'll have various things like we've already seen in the spotter talk, um, talking about well, in this case, on a scale from like 1 to 5, what's the tornado risk, the hail risk, wind, flash flood, and lightning? Again, it's just going to help you have a better idea of what to expect when it comes to severe weather. Now, as we get a little bit more closer to the actual severe weather event, maybe hours into the future, we may, in conjunction with the Storm Prediction Center down in Norman, Oklahoma, issue either a severe thunderstorm or tornado or flash flood watch. When a watch is issued, that means conditions are favorable. The shit storms develop in or near the watch area. 
They could produce either severe weather or a tornado or flash flooding, you know, depending on what type of watch we have. Now, when this watch is issued, that does not mean cancel all your plans immediately and seek shelter, but it does mean you better pay pretty close attention because storms may, may move in with little or no advance warning. We do our best to issue warnings in advance of the severe weather developing, but it's not a guarantee. I think the average lead time from when we issue the warning to when a tornado touches down is around 13 or 14 minutes. So that's pretty good, but that's an average. That means some tornadoes don't get a warning and other tornadoes get 30 minutes of warning. But if you know that there's a tornado watch in effect and the storm's getting really bad and maybe a warning hasn't been issued, you may make the prudent choice to just go to the basement anyway. Okay, now I mentioned three different types of watches we issue. You know, severe thunderstorm watch, usually that's for, well not usually, it's we issue that when we're expecting large hail and or damaging wind. If we're expecting tornadoes, we'll issue a tornado watch. Now, if, if it's tornadoes, hail, and strong winds, we'll still just issue a tornado watch. We're not going to issue a severe thunderstorm strong watch and tornado watch. It just kind of like gets kicked up a notch. And then if it's more of a hydrologic event with, with heavy rainfall, we may issue a flash flood watch. Letting you know the conditions are right, that if the storms develop as we think they will, you may end up with heavy rain and flash flood. Now, let's say storms are starting to pop, and our forecasters are very uh, diligently monitoring the, rad the radar, uh, trying to identify storms. We're getting a lot of reports in from our spotters, from you all, and the warnings are coming out. That's when it's time to seek shelter, because if we issue a warning, that's telling you that severe weather is either imminent or it's already occurring. You need to take action immediately if you're doing anything outdoors. Certainly go inside if you're in the path of the storm or you're in the morning. Uh, that's go time. <coughs> Be straightforward. So our specific criteria for the various types of, of, of warnings, for a severe thunderstorm warning, it's got to be either one inch diameter hail or greater, or 58 mile an hour winds or greater. And you might say, well, why don't you just go to 60 miles an hour, which puts up a 58? It's because we issue them for 50 knots. 50 knots equals 58 miles an hour. It's an aviation thing. The aviation industry told us they need 50 knots, so that's what we do. Tornado warning, uh, we issue that when uh, we have strong evidence of a tornado on radar. Uh, maybe it's very, very strong rotation in the part of the storm that we expect the tornado to form in. Uh, since it's a dual pole radar, we can actually see things called debris balls, which are, it's almost, it's almost not even debatable whether or not there's a tornado there because we have things that aren't, we have, I don't know how to, we have things in the air that shouldn't be. Grass, leaves, pieces of the houses, whatever. Because of the shape and the nature of the item that the radar is detecting, we know it's not rain, we know it's not something biological like insects or birds, it's something completely different. That sticks out like a sore thumb if it's close enough to the and then finally, flash flooding. Oh, we also, if we, if we even if we don't have, if we don't have a signature on radar, and we're getting a report from a trained spotter, a reliable spotter, that can push us to issue the warning as well. Now, usually we would want it to also be on a day when conditions are favorable for tornadoes. For instance, if we got reports of a tornado this morning when the cold front came through, we would not issue a tornado warning because it's pretty much impossible. We're probably getting a bad report from, a, from a, a poorly trained spotter. But if it's a day that, hmm, boy, you know, conditions are close, we could, we could get tornadoes to develop. And just because radar doesn't show it, if you guys report that in, it'll probably tip us over the, <coughs> over the edge to, to issue that warning. Oh, and then flash floods, warnings, obviously we issue that for extreme rapid rises in creeks that will eventually impact roadways, things like that. So a safety question. Let's say uh, you're, doing your, you're doing your due diligence and you're, you're increasing your situational awareness by reading the situation report, and you see a graphic that shows a slight risk of severe weather over our area for this afternoon and evening, and you have tickets to the Royals. And, and game time at the Royals is 6 o'clock. At 8 o'clock in the morning, are you going to decide, hey, I'm going to try to stick my tickets on StubHub, I'm not going to the game, or are you going to completely cancel your plans? Probably not. 
You know, because that means severe weather could develop in there. But I'm probably going to, like, press my luck a little bit, right? Because I really want to go see the Royals. And so, yeah, just the outlook phase is not the time to be canceling it your plans, but it should tell you you better pay close attention as your event draws near. Okay, oh, I didn't even, I forgot about that. Oh, it's tough, oh, yeah. So yeah, I would do three, right? Because you're going to go through life missing a lot of fun stuff if every time there's a threat of severe weather, you just, you know, go in your hold up in your house and don't do anything. Yeah. Now, what if, what, what if, Coffin Stadium's in a tornado warning, and what would you do then? Probably stay home. What if we issue a tornado watch, and we say, and you, and you hear the TV guy say, this is uh, one of those rare instances, the Storm Prediction, said, Storm Prediction Center has said, this is a PDS watch, a particularly dangerous situation, and maybe the storms are expected to roll through Kansas City around 6 o'clock. What are you going to do? I'd probably stop up and <laughs> right? There's 81 games a year at Kauffman Stadium. There's not going to be 81 games this year. Whatever. Okay, let's talk about some other ways that you can you can either build your situational awareness and you can better position yourself to deal with the weather that runs that comes in. As a government employee, I'm not allowed to recommend specific apps or websites. Well, I can tell you I love the National Weather Service website. There's a lot of information. It may not necessarily be the easiest to use, but there is a tremendous amount of information there. But most of you probably have a smartphone, right? There's a lot of really cool weather stuff you can get on a smartphone. If you're really interested in being a spotter, you should probably get some sort of radar application. If you're a mobile spotter, you should get a radar application that allows you to push the little GPS button and also display your location on the radar. Okay? You should have a way to get the forecast. Now, I have, this is the mobile forecast that you can make into an icon on a smartphone. This is the National Weather Service website. But on, I have that, but honestly, more times than not, I just use it on my iPhone. I use Apple's little weather thing. Because for most things, it's close enough. Now, if there's thunderstorms forecast, I will look at a situation report and see how bad it's supposed to be. But more times than not, any old forecast app would probably be reasonably good. Uh, you need some way to get warnings directly to you. We're going to talk about... Uh, wireless emergency alerts in a slide or two, but I am, I guess I'm not supposed to do this, but I am going to recommend one app that I've had some luck with, and the Red, it's the Red Cross Tornado app. I think that's generally a pretty good app for receiving uh, tornado warnings on. Anybody have bad experiences with that? No? What we really need is we need somebody, we need an independent agency to go through and evaluate all these apps, somebody who can recommend and say this is good, this is bad, uh, and then finally, the social media apps, Twitter and Facebook, you can certainly follow everything that's going on in our office uh, if you have that. Now, yeah, and you gotta have a, you need a way to receive the, the warning, something automated that's gonna alert you that you don't have to be looking at all the time. And that's really one of the things that I, I rely on quite a bit, but it's not 100% reliable, is wireless emergency alerts. Over the last five or so years, you've probably all had this go off at one point or another. Uh, Usually in our area, the two things that go off for are tornado warnings or flash flood warnings. They also will occasionally go off for amber alerts as well. But, you know, you can disable this off your phone. I'd recommend you don't. But you can do that if, if, if they're really annoying to you. But for me, I think it's a good fail-safe. Either there's a backup to the weather radio or whatever kind of app you're going to be using uh, to get your, your warning information from. Other ways to get the information, we mentioned the weather radio. Uh, Still a very good thing for you to use. The downside of weather radio is if a warning goes off for anywhere in your county, whether you're in it or not, your weather radio is going to go off. So that's kind of a bummer, right? It's going to overwarn you. Uh, storm sirens, there's all sorts of storm sirens all over Johnson County, but they are outdoor warning sirens. They are not meant to be heard indoors. You may be able to hear it on the first Wednesday of every month when they do the test. But usually the weather's clear when that's happening. What's it going to Are you going to hear it when it's pouring out? Maybe got a little hail hitting the roof and the winds are howling 40 miles an hour? Probably not. Most of you, or many of you, will be watching TV if it's not 3 in the morning. So you may be able to get warning information from that. And then there's a variety of other systems. There's something called Code Red. Usually it's the county that is paying for this. I subscribe to something called Weather Call. I think I pay them 10 bucks a year or something, and they call me whenever my house is in a tornado warning. Uh, but there's a 
lot of different things out there. Okay, let's talk about weather safety. So these are things you need to be doing before the storms arrive. What I do every single morning is I check the forecast just to see what we're expecting. Not only for today, but what are the next couple of days look like? If we're forecasting thunderstorms, I go a little bit deeper and I'll look at the situation report. I like to tell my family, I will, we have like a group family text, we've got three kids, wife and three kids, and I will say, hey, looks like the storm should be rolling through between 5 and 8 o'clock. You know where your safe place is and get there for warning. If you live in a mobile home, you probably need to be planning what you're going to do before the storms get there so you can not be there when the storms arrive. Because if it is tornadic, a mobile home is probably not one of your better locations to be. If you've got some sort of uh, big outdoor thing planned, maybe it's, maybe it's not big. Maybe you plan on being golfing or fishing or something like that by yourself. And there's severe weather but it's supposed to roll through about the time. You may want to alter your plans. Either do it sooner or postpone it. And then, as we mentioned before, not only do you want to brief yourself ahead of time, as the weather is developing, you want to stay tuned and kind of stay abreast of what's going on as well. So during the storms, first of all, you've got you to have a brain, right? You shouldn't be up on top of the roof, watching the storms roll in, trying to film it. But if it's a severe thunderstorm warning and you're outside, it's very simple to seek shelter. Just move indoors. Move into a sturdy, well-built structure. If it's a tornado warning, we already talked about this, if you have a basement, the best thing to do is get in the basement under something sturdy. Uh, in my house, we get under the stairwell in the basement. If you don't have a basement, you want to get to the lowest level of your home, uh, into an interior windowless room if possible, putting as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. How about, what are you supposed to do if you're at work? Let's say you work in a high-rise office building. And high rise is Kansas City, so we'll say high rise is maybe mid rise, maybe 10 stories. What are you going to do if you're on the fifth floor and you don't have a basement? Any ideas? I, yeah, if you, if you ever watch a building getting built like that, one of those office buildings, the first thing they build are the stairwells, and that's usually reinforced concrete, poured concrete, right? I'd get the stairwell and I'd go as low as possible. The stairwell is full, I'd probably go try to get to an interior room on as low as floor as possible. Wouldn't be in the elevator, wouldn't be looking out with all the glass, you know, watching the storm come in. Yeah, that's a pretty good rule anytime you're in a building, get as low as possible. How about in your car? You know, we used to tell people as little as like five, six, seven years ago, if you're in your car and you see a tornado, freak out and get out of your car and go lay in a ditch. Isn't that stupid? <laughs> Most tornadoes move from one location to another, somewhere between 30 and 50 miles an hour. And you've heard me say this before, those of you who have been here, who has a car that doesn't go 50 miles an hour? <laughs> Not many people, right? So we tell people, if at all possible, just drive away from the tornado. It's not rocket science. You don't have to go 100 miles an hour. Just, if the tornado's moving this way, drive that way. Okay? It's pretty common sense. Okay, and as far as mobile spotting, we haven't really talked about much that would make you a, well, this isn't even a real word, but like a certified storm chaser, right? There's some certifiable storm chasers, but I don't think there is such a thing as a certified storm chaser. This isn't a storm chasing class. If it was, we'd be getting into a lot more depth about um, probably having a partner with you and having some in-car navigation with radar overlay and having all these weather subscription services pouring into your car. And you'd probably have GoPros all over your car. We'd be talking safety, 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 where to position yourself, and escape routes, and all that stuff. We're not, we haven't really talked about any of that stuff. This is a storm squadron class. For those of you with, in, the, in the Johnson County ECS, that means you have a designated location you go and sit and watch the storms, right? For the rest of you, that means what do you see in front of your house? Now, if you are a mobile spotter, one of those people that's getting deployed out to a location, you need to be thinking about what are you going to do if your cell phone dies and you don't have mapping on it? Or you don't have, the data goes out, you don't have radar data anymore, you can't see the storms. What are you going to do? Well, maybe a paper map would be good if you're not familiar with where you're at. Realistically, you folks that work for Johnson County or volunteer for Johnson County probably know where you're at, you know the roads very well. I'd say, 
if you're getting deployed to a new place this year, go drive around on a quiet weather day. Get all the landmarks laid out. Know where you're at. Know what your escape routes are. So if one way is blocked, you've got another two or three or four ways out. Okay, that would probably be the best thing you could do to prepare ahead of the severe weather. And again, if you're out there, don't lose situational awareness. Don't be enamored with this really cool looking cloud feature that you know is not going to produce a tornado and completely miss the wall cloud and the tornado that's formed off to your left and moving in. Always keep your head on a swivel. If possible, have a partner with you in the car to be an extra set of eyes to keep you abreast of what's going on. <clears throat> okay, and then weather sa safety after the storm hits. First and foremost, your safety is the number one priority. If a tornado has come through, there's going to be a lot of debris everywhere, a lot of broken glass, a lot of nails sticking out of boards. There could be very weak structures. There could be tree limbs ready to fall. There could be power lines on the road. You just can't go running around willy-nilly checking on your neighbors. Now, you can very carefully check on your neighbors, right? But you get, you've got to keep your wits about you and be looking for dangers that are going to be lurking everywhere. You've got to make sure the threat's over. Okay? Maybe you think that there's nothing going on. Maybe the tornado's gone, but is there still lightning around? That's a threat, right? Keep in mind that there's not an all-clear siren. Johnson County and their siren system don't blow them again once the storm has left. I don't know of any municipality that does that. It would be confusing, wouldn't it? And yeah, like I said, don't be in a rush to get outside. Give us some time. Make sure everything's good where you're at. Make sure all the people around you are safe. Take care of those that are injured. Okay, so let's talk about, let's wrap this up talking about how to report. We want you to tell us, right, time event location, what's going on. So let's go through some, some exercises here. First of all, hail. I'm not going to tell, I'm not gonna, we're not going to say time every time, right? That's the time it occurred. So if you're calling me at 450 and it happened 10 minutes ago, you'll say it hailed at 440. What was the event? It was hail. And don't say, I got a whole bunch of marble sized hail. Say, I've got a whole bunch of dime sized hail, or, whole, or I've got a whole bunch of dime sized hail, and there's one quarter sized hailstone in here. We want to know about the biggest hailstone, but we also want to know about generally what it was. And then where did it occur? If you just say, I got hail at my house, so I don't know where you live. But I live at the intersection of Oak and Maple Street in Overland Park. Okay, we can find that. Or I live one mile east of Nebraska Furniture Mart in Wyandotte County. Okay, we can find where that's at. I live near Kaufman Stadium. We can find where that's at. Or maybe you were driving, right? And it hailed at mile marker 78 on the interstate. Okay, for wind, this gets a little trickier. First of all, we want to know about what is damaged, first and foremost. And one of the things that drives me nuts a lot of times we'll have like all the windows blown out of the house. And the first report we get is the home was destroyed. And so we're thinking, holy cow, that's got to be 100 mile an hour winds, right? It's got to be completely, complete devastation. Maybe the home's not even, maybe we had a tornado. What do we know, you know? So try to, yeah, maybe it's destroyed, but let us know. Now the windows are blown out of the house. Or, the garage door got blown in, or even the garage roof got ripped off, but the rest of the home appears intact. Let us know that. If you've got a tree that got blown over, how big is the tree? Was it snapped off or was it uprooted? Do you have tree branches down there? How big are the tree branches? Don't speculate. Don't see like four trees snapped off and say, we had a tornado. Unless you saw the tornado, you don't know what you had. Could have been a very strong straight line winds. Maybe the tree trunks are sort of rotten. You've seen that before where they're sort of hollow inside. Don't speculate what caused the damage. Do you have a way to measure wind speed? If you do, if you have one of those little home weather stations, oftentimes they're not the most accurate for wind speed. But if you got something, okay, give it to us. But we're going to be more concerned about the damage. If you're watching it, I guess you could try to estimate the wind speeds. But, I mean, some of those, those wind videos we watch is crazy strong. I mean, clearly it had to be more than 60 miles. We saw trees snapping off. Okay, that's okay to say 60, 70 mile an hour wind. But do you know the difference between 40 mile an hour winds, 50 mile an hour winds, 60 mile an hour, 70? I don't. 
So if you're estimating, it's pretty much a, a wag, which is a guess, right? And so a guess isn't all that good. We'd rather be concerned with what the, what the uh, damage was that the winds produced, even if it's nothing but twigs or leaves on the ground. Okay, for our tornadoes and funnel clouds. Now, you, you, you don't have to report it that it's rotating, but that's what you need to be asking yourself every time. Am I sure this is rotating? Because if it's not rotating, you don't have a tornado or a funnel cloud, do you? Now, it's okay to see something in the distance and maybe you can't tell if it's rotating. You can tell us, hey, this is, it looks like a, a tornado or a funnel cloud extending from the rain-free base of that storm. It's too far away to tell if it's rotating but it looks pretty good. As far as where is it out, it's easy for people to say, hey, I'm, in, I'm at a Nebraska furniture farm. We've got a tornado. Well, maybe you're looking at a tornado five miles to the west. Try to estimate how far away the tornado is and where it's at from where you are. Because that, that's one of the worst things that happens at the office is we'll get three tornado reports from the same storm and they're all saying it's at a different place. And they're oftentimes separated by four or five miles. It's because people are reporting in where they're at and not where the tornado is at. Okay, and then as far as flooding, let us know about water over the roads. How deep, can you estimate how deep the water is over the roads? Is it flowing? Is it ponded? Is the road closed? Do you have idiots trying to drive through it? What's going on out there? Is this typical for that location? This is some place that, I, got, I live in Pleasant Hill, Missouri. And there are places I know that if we get an inch and a half or two inches of the rain in an hour, they're going to flood every single time. Is it one of those type places? Or is it something that you've lived here 20 years and you've never seen a flood? That just gives us an idea of just how rare, how unusual it is, and really probably the magnitude of what you guys are facing. Okay, so if you can kind of qualify it like that, that will help quite a bit as well. Okay, so we're going to play this game, what to report. I'm going to stop this a minute. We're going to back it up. I want you to watch this, watch the whole video very closely. I think it's this first one. I had to watch it three times. And I went next door to Al, who's in the next office over, and said, I think this is it. And, and we're like, yeah, we came to an agreement. He said I wasn't necessarily done, at least not this time. So watch what's going on in this time lapse, and let's just see if you're concerned about it. thought they saw a rotating wall cloud? One or two? How many people saw a funnel cloud? One? How many people saw a scud? Most of you? How many people say, I wouldn't even report this? Okay. This is what Alan and I debated over. I think we've got a rotating wall cloud. And let's back up and play it again. And I want you to watch what appears to be scud over here, at least early on, to me, it looks like it right there. Doesn't that look like it's rotating like around like this? Maybe the rotation weakens as it moves in, but certainly there's, there's upward motion. It looks kind of circular, right? So we're, I mean, it's hard to tell because just looking at this video, is there supercell? I don't know. But I will also say another clue here. I think this camera's pointing to the west-southwest. And there's some other things to look at we didn't talk about. This could be something called an RFD, a reflect downdraft there. Notice how it's getting lighter behind it. I think that's a rotating wall cloud. Any questions about that? No? Okay. Let's watch this. I'm going to give you a hint. This is on the leading edge of a squall line. So, if you have a rotating wall cloud, who would say that? Okay, good. Who would say it's a shelf cloud? Okay, a lot of you. Who thinks it's a scud? And who would report it? Okay. This is a shelf cloud. What should you expect when that shelf cloud moves overhead? Probably a wind shift, strong straight line winds, right? The temperature maybe will drop quite a bit. You've all been outside 
and a, and a, and a gust where it comes through, the temperature drops, it gets super windy. Yep, that's this. Okay. Okay, would you report, who would report 60 to 70 mile an hour winds and branches down? Quite a few of you. How about baseball and softball size hail? Who would report that? Some of you. How about both one and two? Some of you. How about both one and two, but mention the hail is not currently falling? More of you. And if any of you, okay, here's one thing I learned in college. Always pick the longest answer. <laughs> That got me through several classes. And that's probably the best, the best answer here as well. Right? Because I'll play it again because oops. Oh shoot. Now we gotta start all over again. Okay. The hail really isn't falling anymore. It has already fallen and now we've got the strong winds. In fact, the wind is blowing the hail. When you're, when you're reporting stuff in, we want you to be as descriptive and detailed as possible. So that, that really is the most detailed answer. We had huge hail. The wind is blowing branches off the trees. It's not hailing right now. That already has moved on. But holy cow, what a storm. And it all occurred at this and this time at this location. As detailed and specific as possible. That really helped us out a lot. And photos are awesome. That's what's cool about Twitter and Facebook. Snap a photo real quick from the safety of your home, right? And you can send that in and say, holy cow, look at that hail, it's huge. Okay. <clears throat> so this is something I want you to, to hope, I hope I have you understanding right now. Just because we issued a warning, we don't necessarily know what's going on on the ground. We're trying to piece together pieces of this puzzle from the radar data, the environment, and maybe some spot reports, but probably not. So just because we issue a severe thunderstorm warning, don't say, ah, they are, you know, their warning said, expect golf ball size hail, that's what I got. No, please report it. We want to know what you have going on at your location. And remember, time, event, location. Okay, I need you to take out your phones. If you didn't do this last year, I want you to do it this year. We're gonna have 30 seconds, and I want you to program in our 1-800 number. This is the number, if you're not part of Johnson County ECS, this is the number we want you to call to report in severe weather directly to our office. It's answered 24 hours a day by a meteorologist. It never goes to voicemail. It never goes to press one for this, two for that. It's always answered by somebody. So let's go ahead and program that in. preferred method we have for reporting stuff into us is the phone, especially if you have something as critical as a tornado. We definitely want that called in. But you can, it, it, let's say you just got like quarter size hail. You can tweet us a picture of it. You can put, post it to our Facebook page. There's a bunch of other ways. There's things called Coca Rods. There's an app called Mping. I'm not going to go all these different ways you can do it. But really, number one is phone. And this are my second favorite way is probably Twitter in your office. But almost everybody's got a phone, so that's going to be Okay, so I'm going to go through that again. That is pretty much all we have. Are there any questions about anything we went over? Yes? Tornado is rotating downdraft. He asked if the tornado is a rotating downdraft. No, generally the tornado is, the air is in addition to rotating, it's also moving up, and it's underneath the updraft as well, so the air is getting sucked up. So it's really more of a rotating updraft. 
Anything else? Yes? I've seen a few mammatus clouds from time to time. Are those indicative to some sort of severe weather activity? You said you've seen a few mammatus clouds from time to time. Are they indicative of any kind of severe activity? And the answer is not necessarily. Those generally form on the underside of anvils of thunderstorms. And it's kind of an indication of negative buoyancy up there where instead of having an updraft, you have air just kind of like falling, right? It just kind of produces those rounded areas of the cloud. If you have that, you know you get a thunderstorm, right? It's on the anvil of a thunderstorm, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get severe weather. Yes, sir? Is the um, PDU indicative of severe weather activity? Is that generally like severe weather? He's asking a PDS watch, a particularly dangerous situation watch. Those are usually issued anywhere from two to six or seven hours in advance. So those days, first of all, those kind of watches are very, very rare. I'd say there's probably two, three, four PDS watches issued nationwide every year. I don't know when the last one we had. It's been several years since we've had one. Um, but it's just it, it, it's issued the same time frame as a normal watch. And that cut anywhere from a couple hours to six or seven minutes. Yes? Okay, he asked about, in layman's terms, the definition of a rear flank downdraft, what it is. Um, without a diagram, it's going to be pretty hard to tell. But let's say you're watching a supercell move in from the west. On the right side, you're going to have a lot of rain, okay, you watch it come at you. On this side, you're going to have a lot of rain falling in the downdraft. You might see the rotating wall cloud right here. And then off to the left, you might see what looks like a little shelf cloud here. And it's like light or clearing behind it. That's air that's descending on the backside of the thunderstorm coming down. And we don't know entirely what it does, but it usually is a key indicator in tornado development. Oftentimes you'll see the rear flank downdraft kind of hook up with some other stuff and then all of a sudden this thing is really getting cranking good and you get tornado genesis. And I realize for those of you that without the diagram, that's pretty much you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Yes? Uh, what, what happens when you call the number? What, what's happening on the other side? Having never done it, what, what's the experience? <clears throat> okay. Um, you, depending how busy we are, you're going to have, to have somebody say, National Weather Service is going to help you. And you'll say, and what you would say, the best thing you could do is say, hey, I'm a train spotter. You can give us your name if you want to. You don't have to. I'm located at this location. We had a golf ball size hill five minutes ago at 840. Do you have any more questions? And they'll say, no, nope, thank you very much. Appreciate your report. Or if, it's, if you say, hey, if, if your report's a little bit more vague, like, hey, this is Jim. I'm over in Olathe. And we had trees down at my house. Well, we're going to say, okay, where in Olathe are you? Because Olathe is big. We're going to say, well, how, what's, what do you mean you got trees down? Were they snapped off or you have branches down? You know, we're going to prompt you for more information. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. If you open the call with, hey, this is so-and-so. I'm a trained spotter. Here's what we received. Boom, 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 boom. The people on the other end are being scribbling down you know, furiously what you're saying. And every big severe weather event we have, we have at least one person dedicated to do nothing but answer the phones. Oftentimes, it's two or three people answering the phones. So, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, as far as reporting. Yeah, I didn't know about the voicemail or something. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and yeah, it, it doesn't, there's no voicemail hooked up to it or anything. So, somebody should answer it 24 hours a day. Yes? El Nino spring, what do you think? Uh, active spring storm season? What's your prediction? I have no idea. El Nino winter was supposed to be warm for the northern plains. That hasn't worked out too well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Yeah. I wish I knew, but I, I don't know. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Are tornadoes like hurricanes? Do they always. <laughs> Spin one way? She asked if tornadoes are like hurricanes, so they always spin one way. Most tornadoes, if you're looking down from above, are spinning counterclockwise. Most. But there have been documented tornadoes, we call that cyclonic rotation. There have been documented tornadoes that spin anticyclonically, that spin the other way, in our hemisphere. 
So yeah, they, they can go either way, but the vast majority of them are rotating cyclonically or counterclockwise if you were able to look from the top down. Yes? So if I use the M team app, does that go directly to you guys? Yeah. We, we have, there's a couple ways we see the reports that come through on MPing. One of them is in our PC-based radar software. It'll show up in there. Um, the thing I'm not crazy about MPing is I don't believe you can put a time in there. Is that right? And I also don't think you can set a location. It's wherever your phone happens to be. So if you submit us a tornado report and you're looking at a tornado five miles away, it's going to put that tornado report where your phone is. So it's OK. But there's better ways to do it. Yes? I've heard that, like, especially when you're looking at a small line tornado, it's real like form, like on the southwest part of the storm. Is that, is that one of those falsehoods? You said a, a tornado forms on a squall line tornado? Towards, like, the southwest part. If you're okay. The storm coming at you, the tornadoes only form in one section. No, that's, that's, that's not, that, yeah, that's false. It's generally true. Oftentimes the conditions that produce supercells have the storms orient in such a way that the storms tend to move from southwest to northeast. And in general, the, the hook echo and the rain through base and all that would be on the southwest side of the storm. But that's not, I mean, it, it all depends on the wind shear, how that thing's gonna set up, what direction it's gonna move and the orientation of the storm. So while that may be the predominant way that they happen, they can happen in a variety of different configurations. Yes? Why is it that the areas that are traditionally identified as Tornado Alley have never experienced a tornado super outbreak? Like say like the states of like Kentucky, Tennessee, and I'm referring to things like the 1974 tornado super outbreak or the 2011 super outbreak. Why is the area that traditionally known as Tornado Alley not experienced something like that? I would say that they probably have experienced super outbreaks, and, and here's why. Um, I don't remember what year was Greensburg. Was that 2006, 2007, something like that? The year that Greensburg got wiped out by a tornado. There were a ton of gigantic tornadoes all across western Kansas that day. Greensburg wasn't the biggest tornado. There were bigger tornadoes that didn't hit anything. There's just nothing out there to hit, so it's harder to document. So, I, so that's why I, I don't necessarily know that that's a true statement. Does that make sense? There's so much more stuff to hit further east. There's trees, there's, it's more populated. I think there has been events and days that have been pretty massive. Yes. The video you showed about the, 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 that you watched two or three times before you kind of figured out what was going on. Put yourself in our shoes. If we saw something like that out in front of our house where we were, should we pick up the phone and call you? I would. Um, if we're not sure. If it's a day like this, I would not pick up the phone and call me. No, but, it, it, but let's it, say you read the situation. You've done your homework. You've built your situational awareness by reading the situation report. It's talked about. Thunderstorms developing this afternoon, possibly potentially supercells. One or two tornadoes may be possible with these storms. And you see something like that move through. I'd call it in and say, hey, it's a little bit tricky what I'm looking at here, but here's what it appeared to be a rotating wall cloud to me. We will then take your report based on where you said it was and when you said it was. We'll match it up with the radar. And if it's in a part of the radar that's like, hmm, we would totally expect that there, they'll be like, okay, that's pretend, that probably is a wall cloud. Now, if it's in some place, it's just like, there's no way that's a rotating wall cloud. And that happens too. And it's not that, not that you're doing anything wrong. You're just not quite sure what you're looking at. But you're giving us an opportunity to match it up with what the radar is showing us as well. Okay, so yes, I would report that in, all things being equal. And let us then compare it to what the radar is saying or what other reports are saying. And it will either help us say, ooh, we need to watch this storm closer because it's getting its act together. Or we'll say, okay, that's not something we have to worry about. That particular report, because it's it maybe it was a, a rain shaft, or who knows what it was. You know? But yeah, you're not gonna, we're not going to call you back up and say, geez, you're dumb. That was not, <laughs> that wasn't, you didn't know what you were talking about. That's, no, because 
I had to watch that thing three, I've been in weather service 25 years, and we watched that three times. I didn't want to got out. I said, oh, am I crazy? And, you know, and so, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Okay, you might want to go talk to me after this, but I will say, take all the math you can. You're going to be doing pretty much everything in college. It's going to be calculus-based. You're going to be taking four semesters of calculus. All of your science classes are going to be calculus-based, which means they suck all the fun out of it. You're not going to be seeing, <laughs> you're not going to be seeing tornado videos. Some professor is going to be deriving equations, and he'll stand back and say, see a tornado, and you'll be like, I don't see that. Um, but you're going to want to take as much math and as high a level of math as possible. That makes sense. So if you have any kind of like pre-calculus or calculus, and you can take that, take that. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate your patience, your time.